In the spring of 2020, we launched the Southern Entrepreneur Conference, where people in the community could hear talks from local entrepreneurs who had built successful businesses from the ground up. We had over 70 people sign up, but of course COVID happened, so we had to move the conference online. After 10,000 views of the videos, we realized we were onto something special. So for 2021, we decided to keep it online. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Jason Hunter Design, Panasonic, whose world headquarters is right here in Peachtree City, and BMW of South Atlanta, who will have a commercial during the intermission of each video. So we do um, uh, branding. That's really our, you know, the heartbeat of the organization is really helping companies with a regular series of problems that they have. And so Eric, who, who consults with us on brand strategy, he says it's kind of like therapy. So companies come to us and they usually have a problem, but they don't know. They know they need to do something, but they don't know what they need to do next. We really help um, companies uh, be honest and truthful about who they are. Um, you know, I think in, as we grow up, we're taught that we need to try to fit in. And in life, it's actually the exact opposite. You should be who you are. So businesses need to be distinct. And there's this mindset that if I'm an accountant, I need to look like an accountant so I need to look like all the other accountants and the fact of the matter is you need to look different so people recognize what you do and what sets you apart and that's where we come in because it's really difficult as an entrepreneur or an owner or even a leader in a company when you're there working every day you're so deep into the business that it's hard for you to get that outside perspective and say hmm how are we really different from the competition and they hire us, and they're the kind of companies that hire a lot of experts to do things for them. And they hire us to give them that perspective. Hey, this is what your customers think of you. Uh, this is what the employees here think about you. And um, this is what we believe is the honest truth about what sets you apart. And uh, a lot of times people say, that's what we were kind of thinking. And so it confirms, and sometimes they're really surprised. So it's, it's a transformative process for businesses because um, I think a lot of people lack confidence in themselves or they feel like they might be a poser or they feel like, you know, maybe I'm not good enough to be doing this. But when you have an outside party that's an expert come in and tell you, hey, this is really special, this makes you stand out, I think it gives them an added layer of confidence that I am doing something right. I, you know, I am making a difference and this is important to our customers. So. When we were working with the city of Canton, uh, they hired us to do a branding for the city. And when we were in the midst of the um, process of figuring out what really set Canton apart, in our research we had come to find that there was three, three topics that rose to the top. One was the history, the history of what was in Canton. There were mills in Canton and, um, and there is a legacy of that particular town. The second was the community, the people that lived there. This, that rose to the top through research and data that, hey, the community here, it's the people that really make Canton special. And then the third was the geography, what it actually looks like. There's some mountains, there's um, lots of park and recreation, and there's Etowah River that runs through the, the um, city from one side to the other. And so in doing the research and then the work, what we found was that what people really loved about that city it wasn't the history, it wasn't the community, it was actually the geography. And it, sh it even shocked us because we were thinking people, people, people. The Etowah River, so it runs from one end of Canton to the other end. So they have people that are kayaking and wanting to get in the water and they can take their kayak and hang out outside. People that want to spend a lot of time outdoors. They want to go hiking, they want to go trail running, they want to spend time in parks with their family. So there's lots of outdoor, beautiful outdoor space that you can you know, recreation in. So that's what I mean by geography. And so what happened was we created the concept for the logo and from the C to the N, uh, we put the river weaving in and out of the letters to symbolize that this is the strength of this town. So if you're interested in either doing business or living in Canton or um, uh, visiting, you know, you're gonna get a lot of this geography there. And it, ha it was very successful, it is very successful today, they use it everywhere and um, it's really exciting to see that happen. Pricing is all over the place and so what we do is 
we spent a lot of time, I've been doing this for 25 years, so I kind of know what it takes to get work done. But sometimes when you come up with a creative idea, it might take you five minutes, it might take you five days. So how do you price that? Do you charge for your five minutes, even though it could be the best idea, or do you charge for your five hours? And that's where, like, that's why you have such diversity in pricing. So what we try to do is price it based on how many decision makers are going to be involved in the process. We know if, if we've got to present to a board and we have to present to a leadership team and there's going to be a lot of discussion, that it's going to take a lot more time for us. We need to have data, we need to do more research, we need to plan on meetings to discuss and offer feedback and revisions versus a solopreneur. You have one decision maker. So technically you're dealing with one person throughout and that makes it require less time. So we have a sliding scale for dealing with a solopreneur or startup versus a company that has 1,500 employees. Mm -hmm. and so that's how we try to price and probably CFOs or operations people would say you don't work with the solopreneurs but that's my personal like love is seeing someone start a business and you know go from hey I want to make five hundred thousand dollars and watching them get there and helping them with the marketing side is super exciting uh, we have people ask us to do social media for them um, and we're not social media experts what we're really good at is helping people with their brand and then extending that into social media. Um, so we have people here that can do it and if we know that a company all they want is social media then we'll, we'll recommend another company that they work with. It depends what they're looking for and if they're B2B, if they're B2C, what kind of business they're in, I'm going to refer them to um, like a company that's really good at that. There's so many special specialties in marketing that no one is great at everything. They're really good at one thing. And we know that we're really good at brand. Mm -hmm. And so if you hire us for social media, you're not hiring us because, hey, we know everything about social media. You're hiring us because we're going to extend the brand consistently, predictably, correctly, and we're going to speak in the brand voice on your social platforms. So not because you're going to get a huge audience, not because you're going to become popular or you're going to have some kind of groundswell, but because we're going to be predictable and good at what we do. PR is so specialized and you've got to be fostering media relationships with people in newspapers, etc. And we don't do any of that. So, And it's the same thing. There's specialists in PR that work with different companies, so we have recommendations. So I went to Sterling High School. That's the name of my town. Sterling, Illinois, small town. And I was going to be a speech pathologist. Uh, my friend's mom, Penny Hammer, was a speech pathologist. and. I thought she was super cool and I'm like, okay, I know you can, it's very, you know, sought after. And um, so then I had to pick what school I wanted to go to and I knew how much money I had raised from the farm. So it was Illinois State, Miami of Ohio or University of Iowa. And I loved Miami of Ohio, but I didn't want to have student loans. So I picked Illinois State because it was the cheapest of all of them. I knew I could go there and work a little bit and not have any college loans, so that's why I picked it. And after my first semester in speech pathology and taking those intro classes, I hated it and said, this is not at all what I want to do. And I talked to my counselor and she said, well, what do you really like doing? And I said, well, I like art, but there's no money in it. She said, why don't you go talk to the dean of the art school and see what she has to say. So that's what I did. And she told me about this thing called graphic design. This was in 92. So not many people had heard of it or knew what it was. And she told me about what the career would be like and you could work in an advertising agency and I was just like blown away with how glamorous it seemed like art directing photo shoots and designing magazine spreads and you know working in Chicago or New York and I just thought it was amazing. So then I decided to switch my major to graphic design and went through the whole program. Knew at that time that I wanted to have a small three to five agent firm to do great work. So I looked at the best schools in design and they were um, RISD and uh, University of Cincinnati and Virginia Commonwealth and I applied to all those schools and um, went on all the interviews and I got into University of Cincinnati and then they called me like 30 days before school start and said that one of um, our new students backed out and we have one additional assistantship to offer and we'd like to offer it to you. and it was a free ride and you had to work. You had to work at the art gallery 20 hours a week to do all the marketing for the shows that were coming in. 
So it's amazing. Like that was amazing. So I went to University of Cincinnati and um, after living in Ohio and being in class, what I realized was that how could I be a great teacher if I didn't actually work in the real world, that I was teaching on theory and I wouldn't be a great resource for students if I didn't actually have on-the-job experience. So I decided to leave and do that, do just that, get experience, and then come back and finish my master's later. So I, husband and I moved to here, to Georgia, and we moved in with his mom for three months. He found a job. He has an art degree as well, but he has his art degree in fine painting. Got a job in three months, and I worked at S.P. Richards and this is like embarrassing to say because they designed covers for office supply magazines and I was bought, brought in as one of their designers to design the sales materials and those magazine covers and there was literally a department designated to taking pictures of cats and kittens with office supply products. Do you remember the posters? It was like, you know, it had, had his little paw up and it was like, just hang in there. You know, do you remember, yeah, do you remember that? Like that? Yeah. yeah it's been a lot. So yeah, the kitten and dog. And uh, I was there for six months. And the job that I really wanted was at a company called Check Free, where they had a really good in-house agency. So I, at six months, I put in my resignation and went to Check Free um, for less money. I think I was making twenty six or $27,000. So I went to Check Free, but I, what was great about Check Free was this is when you didn't have to pay for the beginning of not having to use checks to pay, make payments. That was the whole idea of the financial institution. And what we got to do was design um, software packages. So what it looked like, the name of the company, all the marketing materials, and we got to do everything that a designer wants to do. Fancy die cuts, finishes. Um, unique folds, uh, formats. It was so much fun. And the designer and writer that I worked with were very, very good. And it was a great, um, just great experience of working on what it took to be a really good designer. And then one day they walked in and said, we're getting rid of the entire marketing department and um, two, you, your job's gone in two weeks. You're going to be leaving. So... I was out of a job and I thought, wow, I didn't think that could happen. You have a degree, now you lose a job and really? I mean, I went to school to have, you know, a job and not have to worry about losing it and there it was. So a friend of mine was working at IBM and I was telling him about, you know, losing the job and he said, hey, I know somebody, this guy named Peter at IBM and I can put your resume in front of him. We're taking this intermission to thank our sponsors, Jason Hunter Design, Panasonic Automotive, and to watch this lifestyle video from BMW South Atlanta. They have a great service center there, as well as new and used vehicles for sale. I said, okay, so I gave him my resume, got a call from IBM. I met with Peter Blakeney and they were working in e-business innovation services. And, and what that aspect of the IBM did is we built million dollar websites for companies like Kodak and Macy's and New York Times. Um, I got a call back less than a week, I got the job. And so I spent three years working there, building huge websites I moved from artist up to art director in those three years, and I was nicknamed the negotiator, so if they had a problem on a project or the salespeople had set up false expectations, they would bring me in to help on projects. Kodak was one of those. Um, and I, 
don't know why they called me the negotiator, but something that's always stuck with me is that if a client asks for something, you should always show it to them, whether you agree with it or not. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I did there is, and that's something I brought to this company is that if a client asks for it, even if you think it's not going to turn out, don't say no. Say, yeah, hey, this is what it's going to look like. We think this might be a better solution. So then you hit the dot com era where it was, this was 99, 2000. And in 2000, we heard rumblings of them getting rid of, you know, doing a layoff because this was the dot com bust. And they, what they offered was a voluntary severance where you can leave and they'll pay you for two months. And so I thought, oh, that's cool. And a friend of mine that was there said her and another woman were starting a company and if I wanted to join them. So I said, all right, I'll go meet with them. So I met with them. They offered me a, more money than I was making at IBM and they called it a balloon payment, which I still don't know today what that is, but um, I was going to be making 85000 I was super excited, but they were going to start me off on a small amount of $2,500 a month, and then each month it would increase to get me at the end of the year to the $85,000. Well, after three months of working there, I wasn't making any more money, and I went to the owner and I said, hey, you know, if I'm not getting paid what you promised me, I'm going to have to get lawyers involved. I was naive. I wrote that in an email. So stupid. The next day, I get brought into her office. She says, I've never offered you a position here. You've never worked here. You need to take all of your things and leave the premises immediately. So I was devastated, completely devastated. And um, I had to make a decision there. Do I start my own company or do I go find another job? And so I, I did both. I worked on getting a job and I worked on you know, trying to find business and doing it the old-fashioned way, making phone calls. I opened up the yellow pages. We had dial-up internet at our house, so you can get on the internet. Someone would pick up the phone, it would collapse. So I did um, wrote letters to companies that I was interested in working with, and um, I started getting business. And uh, I think I had a 15% return on my cold call letters. <laughs> People calling me after I wrote them a letter about what I was doing and why I wanted to work with them. And I started in April, this is when I got fired, started in April through December, and I thought if I could make $35,000, it would be worth it to work for myself, to not have to work for anybody else, that I can live very, you know, simply. I don't need a lot of money, I love shopping at a thrift store, you know, I can drive a used car, I, nothing. So I, that was, that's what I wanted to do, and from April to December I made $90,000, and I thought, Maybe this is something that I could do. Yeah, I was doing graphic design work. Um, and, you know, what you do is you call your friends and family and everybody that you know and you ask them for work. And that's, that's what I did. So my sister-in-law, Janelle, worked for a company called IMI. And at that time, this was just after, this was 9-11. So, so, you know, April to December, 9-11 happened in September. So what happened after 9-11 is that the company couldn't afford the New York agency they were hiring. They would do like three concepts three concepts for $10,000. They couldn't afford that anymore. So she asked, hey, could you do the, this work for us? And I was like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I got a little project for them. Then I got another project and another project. And so I got a lot of food and beverage work through this other company because they weren't able to afford the company they were working with before 9-11 mm -hmm. because hospitality was just in the dump. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So it was all graphic design work, lots of menu design, um, lots of promotional materials, um, packaging design, logo design, um, and tons of food and beverage type work. My next door neighbor, the Reeds, who I adore, they're, they had two kids, Bill, Bill and Lou, and Bill was 15 or 16 at the time, and he was writing code, like doing, like building websites. Oh, yeah. And I asked him if he wanted to come work for me, like part-time, make some money. And so he took a co-op at Roswell High School, which is where he was at, and so he got class credit for working for me in the afternoons. Nice. And he was the first, like, assistant. Mm -hmm. And he ended up working for ID8 on and off for 11 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's now working at Pardot. Uh, he's doing fantastic. He's married and has a kid. So being a farm kid, um, it was just different from everybody else because the farm wasn't a huge part of the small town that I lived in. It was a small part of it. Um, so it was unusual. 
So I'd have friends come out to my house and stay at the farm and they look back at it now. My friend Beth was saying that it was like some of the best times just coming out and working on the farm with me. Now I didn't think it was the best time growing up. It was a lot of work and I didn't want to have to get outside and do the work, but my friends really appreciated it. Um, but you know, every day we had to go out and do chores. We'd have to bring the cows in from the pasture. We'd have to bring them in for milking, clean up the poop, you know. We had to feed the steers, um, you know, pick the eggs from the chickens. Uh, we'd have to um, water and just do all kinds of stuff. But the best time of year was when all the cows were having calves. And this was in the winter, so we'd do artificial insemination for most of them. And then when they couldn't get pregnant, we'd have a bull. But he'd set them, my dad would set it up for them all to have babies around the same time. So in the winter, when it's, you know, zero degrees, you'd have the bar barn would be so warm because it'd be filled with straw and all the cows would be in there. And then you'd have all the calves and you'd hear them like mooing and, and getting to feed them milk. That was the best thing. So, you know, we'd, ha we'd help. I mean, I birthed a lot of calves. You know, you pull them out, you have to put chains on their little ankles and help the mom have the calf and put the little straw on the the calves nose so it could breathe you know because they have trouble breathing and before in 20 before you know it in 20 minutes they're up walking and they're wobbly little legs um, but then they each have their little own slot where they eat and you feed them milk and you know just petting their little wet noses and feeding them milk and watching them grow up that was just that was the best part with all the babies so they become friends with everybody my dad did business with people he was friends with you know and I, I as an adult, I noticed that he had really had relationships and he appreciated and respected people, even if he was paying them or they were paying him. So even down to the car wash, like he didn't just walk in and not even look someone in the eyes. They knew everybody that worked at the car wash. So what my dad did, I think, which is the coolest thing, and I've never heard of anybody else saying this, my dad didn't go to college. He's a smart man and a hard worker and he knew how to make a business work. And that doesn't come from, that's just, I think naturally he had this ability to look at numbers and figure things out. So what he did with each of us is he helped us create a business. So I bought a calf from him, which was $120, and then we had to pay for taking care of the calf, the barn, the, the pasture, the feed. And every month we would go in and we would look at the books and we would have to, he'd look at the price of alfalfa, look at the price of oats look at the cost of milk, and then you'd have to, you know, pay for that. And so by the time that one calf became a cow and started producing milk, which was the money, I had a big debt to my dad to owe him. And part of the labor was us working. So if we worked on the farm, then the labor was another positive that he didn't have to pay. He would be basically paying us to do that work. Then when the, you had a calf, then you had two animals, but then every month we would look at the milk that the cow produced. And we, I don't know how he did the calculation, but we usually had 50 head milking and he would calculate my cow. So if it was Regina, they all had names, Regina and all the cows produced this much milk. I don't know how you could figure it out, but he would calculate what that milk was worth based on the production of the herd and then my cow. And then we would make profit from that. And so that's, that particular process is how I learned to like look at the finances um, and you know look at the costs and hey if you have too many costs you're not going to make any money so how do you make more money if you have cattle you have more females and then if you have steers then you boys you castrate them raise them as steers and then sell them to the market so by the time I went off to college and I think that was age 9 or 11 I don't remember which time I went off to college and I sold my herd to my dad, I made $14,000. So that's what I used to pay for college. I would say almost exactly what you said. If you say you're going to do something, do it. That put, sets you apart from so many other businesses. It's, it's sad to say that, but it's that simple. If you're going to do something, and you say, I'm going to do it by this time, and this is what I'm going to do, do it. Be a person of your word. And I think the other piece is surround yourselves with experts. Even if you don't think you can afford them, I mean, don't do your own bookkeeping. Don't do your own legal work. Hire someone. They, you need to focus on the business and making money in the business, but doing those other things aren't going to make you any money. It just takes away your time, and time is the most valuable resource that you have as a business owner. So it's, it's scary 
to pay someone for bookkeeping. It's scary to pay an attorney $300 an hour. But you know what? It's better. I think you've got to be true to yourself, too. Um, what do you mean by that? Mm, I spent a long time trying to be perfect and, you know, perfectionism. And I thought, if I'm perfect, then I'm going to get hired or I'm going to be better at this or I'm going to be able to do this. And it's, it's stupid. It's actual better, actually better to be real, to be vulnerable, to be, you know, who you are. You're going to get, you're going to connect with people. And so what happened in that perfectionism, I just kept setting up walls between people. And I could never, because I was so stoic and trying to be this thing versus being myself, I couldn't connect with anybody because I would never let them know who I was. So, um... It's scary. It was very scary for me to do that, and but it's been the biggest freedom for me at now as a more mature business owner. And I think in year ten is when I learned that is that it's okay, you know, to screw up. It's okay to tell people that. And so at the same time, I set up values for my company, and so one of our values is that family is first, and. Uh, uh, I really struggle with the balancing act of, you know, business and then personal life. And I really don't think it's a balancing act. I think it's all mixed together and it's messy and that's just the way it is. But when you have to make a decision, what's going to come first? And so for me, it's always family's going to come first. So I had a meeting with a, a sales, a prospect, and I realized that I had to go to a conference for my daughter. And it was a really important one. I needed to go, and I double booked myself. So I had to call up the person, and I said, hey, you know, I double booked myself, but I have to go to this conference for my daughter, so I'm going to need to reschedule. And I thought for sure, I'm like, well, there's business lost. You know, screw that up. You know, I can't even schedule a meeting. Why would, you know, why would anybody hire me? And she said, oh, I totally get it. Let's reschedule the meeting. I would do the same thing. We rescheduled the meeting. I ended up getting the work.